was a lot shorter than the other ones. <laughs> the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. From that time on, after Peter confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of the Lord. So wasn't it just last week that we heard Jesus praising Peter for how great he was? I mean, that story was in the, the verses immediately before today's gospel lesson. And so if you remember last week's gospel, Jesus asked his disciples that question, who do you say that I am? And as we heard, Simon Peter had no problem confessing who Jesus is. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Good work, Peter. And this is where we hear, start to hear Jesus gush about Peter for the next two verses. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Great! What could go wrong? Well, literally four verses after this excitement about Peter, Matthew gives us this gospel lesson that we just heard, where Jesus is explaining and showing his disciples what is to come for him. Pretty soon his journey is going to face suffering and persecution, and he will be killed. Peter didn't like that, so we hear that Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him and said, this can't be what's to happen, Lord. And then we heard that famous line that Jesus said back to Peter, which was, get behind me, Satan. Suddenly, Peter, who was to be the rock, the foundation on whom Christ would build his church, that same Peter is now a stumbling block to Jesus. In Jesus' opinion, Peter is, an, is evil and an adversary of Jesus. What happened? Well, lucky for us, we hear about a bit about what happened from Jesus. He said, you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And so I wonder, how often do we get more consumed with human things than we do with godly things? How often are we more concerned about the ways of this world than we are about the ways of God's kingdom? And what's with this whole business of denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following? I mean, let's think about where Peter was with all of this. He was just told that he was the rock. He was just told that Christ's very church would be built on that rock. He was told that he was so strong that the gates of Hades would not prevail against it. He was even told that he'd have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. If we heard that, we'd be on cloud nine, and I'm sure Peter was as well. 
All the time that he put into following this Jesus guy around. All the effort he was putting into learning and practicing what Jesus was teaching. It finally paid off. In heaven, we had that feeling that what we're doing is working and, and that there's a reward finally coming from all these efforts. Things were looking up for Peter. Of course, until Jesus started talking about, you know, suffering and persecution and death. I mean, I'm guessing that whole on the third day be raised part was lost on all the disciples after they heard those words and be killed. Wait, Jesus, you were just talking about your church being strong and successful. This can't be part of that same plan, can it? Ah, what ends up that Jesus' version of strong and successful probably isn't the same understanding we have of strong and successful. So I have to tell you something that, that Kim and I have been observing. I, I'm sure that a lot of you realize that um, our daughter Charlotte is not quite as verbal as uh, many other kids her age are. Uh, she just doesn't seem that concerned with speaking. And I can't blame her because when you can point to something and make some noise and get it, who needs to talk, really? Maybe that's the problem. But still, we've been trying to work on this. And one of the things we've been doing and, and having others help us with is learning some basic sign language. So, so now she can do the signs for mommy and daddy and baby and, and some other signs she's made up to signify other family members. She's learned signs for animals. She's learned to you know, drink and eat and wash hands. She's come up with a whole bunch of different signs that I think she's made up, but we at least can communicate, and we know what she's saying, we think. Well, some of those signs are about church. So on Sunday mornings, when we talk about going to church, she gets really excited. I know, double preacher's kid, right? <laughs> and so she starts going through some of her favorite signs about church. So she'll, she'll fold her hands together to talk about praying. And then she rubs her fingers across her forehead to talk about blessing. Both are things that we try to do every night before bed. And then she shakes her hand in the air to indicate sharing the peace. And this is what church is to her. When she hears church, that's what she thinks of. During the week, then, when I tell her I have to go to work and I need to leave, she walks me to the door, she, she points across the street to the church, and she goes through all those signs again. Because apparently she thinks that all I do all week is pray and, and bless and share the peace, which is really more than most of you think I do during the week. <laughs> it never gets old. <laughs> but all of that got me thinking, what is church about? What is church about? And when it comes to worship, we talk about hearing God's word. We talk about offering confession and, and receiving forgiveness. We talk about experiencing God's love and grace through baptism and communion, among many other things. But then we're supposed to respond. And for many of us, that response is what? To go back into the world like nothing happened waiting for that next week to come around so we can come back and do it again. At least that's what it feels like sometimes. So what if instead our response is, as Charlotte has taught us, to pray, to bless, or to share the peace? Yeah, it sounds easy enough, kind of like following the leader was, but... Don't forget about Jesus' words that should be echoing in our ears. If anyone be, wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. So if we hear and believe those words, suddenly praying is not just about us and the things we want and, and the needs of our friends and family, but it becomes praying for our enemies and praying for those who differ from us. And it's about letting God have a chance to speak back to us in the silence. Because honestly, how many of us 
does, does, it, does praying only involve talking to God and not waiting to hear something God says back? So if we hear and believe these words from Jesus, then offering blessing helps us to see the face of God in the other. Blessing each other reminds us that each of us is a child of God, and each of us is connected through this body of Christ. As we heard read in Paul's letter, he writes, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. All that should then allow us to share peace with one another. I mean, think about that physical, peaceful contact with someone who's different from us or someone we disagree with or someone who is an enemy. That contact could even a playing field much easier than violence could. Maybe that's the church that Jesus intended to build on Peter, the rock. Maybe that's a glimpse into what it looks like to to take up our cross and follow. You know, setting aside our human desires and our earthly ways. Humbling ourselves and denying those things that maybe make us self-righteous. It means that when we pray and bless and share peace with others, we're not thinking about ourselves, but we're thinking about our neighbors. It's reminding ourselves that this church is not a building or a social club, but it's a gathering of followers who are seeking ways to show God's love to the world. This is our reminder that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection do make a difference for us and for this world. One prayer, one blessing, one sharing of the peace at at a time. Amen.